when you see someone doing front squats, even with great technique, does it look like the safest thing in the world? Well, if you had to bet, are they going to get injured or is someone going to get injured sitting on a couch? Which one would you bet? You don't just sit on a couch and go, oh my God, my quad ripped off. That doesn't happen, right? So even with good technique, exercise, we're throwing ourselves into the fire. We're putting ourselves in harm way. It's called overload for reasons, over the body's ability to normally experience. That is, it, it's like um combat no matter how good a military gets in combat people die in combat people get shot at the that doesn't matter how awesome your sniper rifle is how great your tactics are the enemy shoots back and even if you're that much better and you do everything right you still every now and again really bad shit happens right so we have to understand that if we get hurt we have to do our best to figure out what went wrong to know in the back of our minds that sometimes the answer is nothing if shit happens and you just have to do your best. You have to recover from the injury and just keep going, right? Because sometimes what ends up happening is that folks get really carried away with trying to figure out why they got hurt. They turn into uh, paralysis by analysis kind of individuals where they watch like every Kelly Starrett video on loop for forever. And they message Quinn Hannock and say, hey, I think everything's wrong with every part of me and I'm, in, I'm imbalanced and i need 50 trillion hours of mobility because i was built wrong god decided to just fucking put my legs where my arms were supposed to be because i'm that uncoordinated and they start to look for reasons and reasons and reasons and you're like so 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 how'd you get hurt and they're like well yeah, i was deadlifting and then like i pulled a muscle in my lower back and I'm like, fucking welcome to deadlifting dude if you're trying hard that shit happens sometimes which is why a lot of people say to me, for example, they say, you know, Mike, you, you seem to do a lot of hack squats, lunges, leg presses and squats, but you don't, I don't ever see you doing leg extensions or this one weird movement or like Bulgarian split squats or whatever. And this is, those exercises aren't that great. So you take your best five or six exercises for sure. You don't really ever have to go to any of the other ones because the other ones just aren't as effective as variants. It's like picking a cheat meal. You got pizza, you got Chinese, you got, you know, sushi. And those are your top three cheat meal foods. You have, let's say, 16 cheat meals in a certain length of time. You just mostly stick to those. They're, they're your favorite foods. But if you're like, ooh, how about Italian food? But you don't really like Italian food, you have to get so bored of everything else that Italian food starts to look good. But that's probably not going to happen because after you've had pizza and Chinese, now you're really craving sushi because it's been three weeks, right? Mm -hmm. So just because those are your top choices and it's enough variation, it means you don't have to go to the worst choices. That structures are going to get degraded over time. Does that make sense? And we have to have pre-programmed active rests that are one to two weeks long and deloads that are about a week long every now and again during the year because we know we have to take them, not because we have we we feel like it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, you it's just like taking a vacation or something like that. You might feel really good, like you don't need a vacation. Take one anyway because you've got a whole month of hard work coming up. Because when the big projects start at work and your deadlines do. It's too late to be like, oh, shit, now I need a vacation. Well, you should have thought of that when the vacation time came up. Does that make sense? Yeah. So auto regulation is great, but you have to have an ultra structure of planned regulation for the stuff you can't feel. Once that's in place, you can smooth the edges by auto regulating when you need or in, so deloading when you need with auto regulation or overloading when you can still handle it. All of those effects, when you only do a meal or a day of eating, are completely transient, and they last about as long as the cheat meal is in your stomach. Now, as soon as the cheat meal is gone, there doesn't seem to be any kind of carryover for heightened metabolism, for enhanced fat burning, or any kind of hunger hormones to be altered past the cheat meal. So that's on the positives. The positives of cheat meal are not that great. That's really all of them. You could say they break up the monotony of dieting, and that can be a positive, but I'll tell you how it can be a negative as well. I've made this analogy before. I'm going to make it here again. It's a, it's a pretty nasty analogy, but I think it still fits. When someone is psychologically tortured by uh, central intelligence agencies around the world, they don't actually just beat you all the time. They don't actually deprive you of sleep and food all the time. Because when everything is bleak and dark, the uh, individual tends to become quite hardened, and they're all very well trained if they get caught, if they're spies. They resist. And if something is bad enough, an individual just basically checks out and goes, you know what? I'm going to die doing this. I signed up for this. I'd like to die for my country. They're not getting shit. They're more clever than that. What they do is they do periods of bleak, periods of terrible, periods of awful. 
And occasionally they cut you some slack. They give you a pack of cigarettes. They give you a warm bed to sleep in. They give you a hot meal. They're very nice to you. And they try to get you to talk a little bit under no pressure. Just tell us something. We don't really want to keep beating you. We don't want to keep putting you in the hole. Tell us some stuff. And, and they don't even say, tell us some stuff and we'll get you more food. They just give you more food and then maybe tell us some stuff. And some, so you don't. And they say, sorry. They just beat you again for a long time. Then they wave that flag at you again, give you that nice meal, give you that warm bed. That pulsatility of looking forward to the respite and the shelling, looking forward to the good, away from the bad, drives people insane. That's how they break people. So another really nasty analogy is if you're trying to quit crack cocaine, you don't just have every now and again a little bit of crack. You just quit because the temptation and the feedback loop are enormous. Just the same way, by the same psychological pathways, for many people, having a cheat meal, especially later into a diet, does break up the monotony. But it introduces such a radical stimulus that ramps up desire for only one thing, more cheat meals. And if it's a scheduled cheat meal, it'll literally drive you insane because every week, the only thing you're looking forward to is that cheat meal. As you're eating it, you get to a point is as you're eating the cheat meal, you already hate it because every bite bling brings you closer and closer to not having any food left on your plate. That is a terrible, terrible place to be psychologically. Then just when you're hitting your stride midweek, when Wednesday or Thursday, let's say you cheat on Saturdays, Wednesday or Thursday, the rebound hunger. So, so after that cheat meal, then the day after and the next day are usually terrible. Your hunger is going to be through the roof. Your cravings are through the roof. It's like giving somebody crack when they're trying to quit. Then by Wednesday or Thursday, the cravings will have subsided and you'll be back to really trucking it. You won't feel like you need a cheat meal. But by Friday, you're thinking of that cheat meal that's going to come on Saturday again. And you're not living in the moment. Your entire life is contorted into what's going to happen for that one meal on Saturday. You plan it. We've all been there. You plan what the cheat meal is going to be. You savor it. And it always disappoints because as soon as you start eating it, you know it's going away. You get into that cycle and it's a very terrible cycle for most people. My recommendation is quite contrary. You're going to diet, embrace the darkness. It's not going anywhere. But once you embrace it, you find to be that it's really not that bad. One of the last things you want is flickers of light and of hope because they actually make things worse. You can make one final analogy. It's like talking to an ex-girlfriend or an ex-boyfriend that you used to be madly in love with. How do you break it off and how do you heal? You don't talk to them ever. You don't look at pictures of them. You stay completely out of touch. But if they come into your life every now and again, it makes things worse. It doesn't make things better. Right? So dieting, the urge, even the urge to reproduce is secondary to the urge to eat. There's only one human urge more powerful than the urge to eat, and that is the urge to drink water <laughs> because it kills you faster. Right? But aside, you know, nobody's restricting water on a diet. Eating is the most powerful psychological warping tool you can have, and I wouldn't play around with it. I have before, and it's always bit me in the ass. It makes dieting harder when you cheat, not easier for most people. And here's the kicker. For the people whom it doesn't make dieting harder, can they do it? Sure. Does it offer any benefits? No. You just eat a bunch of food, and your body ramps up metabolism, burns it off. It stalls your progress for a bit. Do you get any kind of plus one overcompensation? of metabolism from a cheat meal? Absolutely not. 